My name's Cedar Lewis and I'm an artist and um, kind of arts organiser. I live, I'm based in London, but I'm currently um, working in uh, Maastricht, Holland, uh, doing a year-long residency at the Jan van Eyck Academy. So basically, I've, so 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 thanks again for asking me to do the interview. I'm really happy to do this interview. Um, yeah, and the first piece I, I thought would, I would talk about is this a very old piece of mine, but I thought it was relevant to the conversation we were we want to have. And it's basically this: it's um, you know, I did it's 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 kind of like it's part of my degree show piece from 1999. And what the piece basically involved was placing an advert in the in the issue issue 47 of Freeze magazine from August 1999. Uh, or June, July, August 1999, which was when my degree show happened. And what I basically did was um, place a full-page advert in the magazine, which was essentially a photograph of my mother, which said, isn't my mum the greatest, with an asterisk, and then had my name and the show details and a couple of adverts, which kind and, um, were, were, were kind of sponsorship, had a kind of cu couple of kind of thin things on there which looked a bit like they were kind of sponsors. Actually, they were kind of sponsors of the show, but they weren't financial sponsors. But I, as part, part of the piece, was I, I kind of wanted to have the um, the aesthetic of an official advert, so that's why it was important for me to have those those little details which looked like sponsors when in fact they they weren't you know they they wouldn't they weren't they wouldn't they didn't really uh, you know they didn't really have to be on there, but I, I I included them on there. The whys and the wherefores, I guess I could say. Um, uh, you know, I studied at Campbell College of Art. I did sculpture. I graduated in 1999, a long time ago. This is a very old piece, but I thought for this conversation it was important. And basically, the what, basically my my thinking at the time it was it's kind of confused. It was kind of like, you know, it's kind of it's something kind of quite desperate about it. You know, I was you know a young art student. I was fascinated with the art world. I was fascinated with art magazines. I used to spend a lot of time in the library, poring over art magazines. And I kind of had the dream that you know maybe one day I could be in one of those magazines. And I was very inspired by, you know. Jeff Koons and um, uh, you know, uh, you know um, it's, I think Linda, Linda Van Gelis did a famous, famous advert in the magazine, and I, I kind of liked the idea. There were there were these adverts. There were the adverts that kind of had some kind of art historical um, weight in magazine, art magazines, and they almost felt like artworks themselves as opposed to adverts. So I was interested in the idea of an advert being an artwork, but also the idea of an artwork. I had the idea that no one was actually going to come to my degree show. I was like, I, you know, it was like. In reality, no one's going to come to this. Um, so if I put the advert, if I make, if I do an advert for the show and make and put more emphasis on the advert uh, than the actual show, and almost make the show the advert, more people are going to see it. And and I think in a way that proved right because, you know, I did get people from New York saying I've seen this crazy advert in or, or, or all over the place. Like, what's that about? Like, and and it had this weird effect, you know. And, and uh, the, you know, most people just couldn't believe I'd done this thing, and they were like, "Did you actually pay for that and do that?" And um, so, so in a way, it was kind of like a desperate act. <laughs> it was a desperate act of a desperate man or a desperate young, young, desperate young man. But it was kind of, you know, sometimes you just have to have these crazy dreams and just try and do them. And I think I was just into that idea of just having this crazy idea. And in a way, it also, also it was a bit of a manifesto. You know, it was, it was slightly like a bit of a manifesto. I mean, just as, as, so as well as the kind of practicalities and insanely egoistic side of doing this advert, there was this kind of... Um, kind of pseudo-political side as well of the fact of putting an image of my mother. So I, so, so I had the idea that I would do a, an advert, you know, a full-page advert. First I thought I'd just do an advert, but then I thought, well, it's going to be a full page if you're going to do it. And then obviously it's a kind of comment, you know, doing it in Freeze magazine is a comment on that's your, your audience is the, 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 mag, the, the magazine audience. So it's very art world specific. And also it was in 1999, so it was a long time ago before Freeze has kind of come what it is now. You can tell by the, the thinness of this magazine, it's, the Freeze is, is a lot fatter these days. So I think the, that's a reflection of the art scene and the art world as well, that Freeze has become a lot more visible um, than it was maybe in 1999. But even 1999, it was still a, you know, it was still a very powerful, um, uh, you know, a, pow a powerful organization, let's say, within the, uh, within the art world globally and in the UK. So, um, so, so once I decided I'm gonna do this advert, then it was a question of, well, okay, what am I actually going to, what's the image going to be? What am I going to say with this advert? Am I just going to have a text or photograph myself? So I, I, and I, as I said, because I was quite fascinated and obsessed with, with always flicking through art magazines at, at university in the library, you know, all the, all the magazines at the time, Art Forum, Art Monthly, Flash Art, Freeze, whichever others th there possibly were. Um, make. <laughs> um, uh, I, um, 
uh, yeah, I was obsessed with, the, with going through the magazines, and I always kind of study the adverts as much as the articles. And I just, and there did, they, they, there was this set element of underrepresentation of kind of ethnic minorities and women in those images that I saw. And so I kind of thought it would be funny to do a slightly po-faced um, image of my mum saying, "Isn't my mum the greatest?" with an asterisk. And, the, and it was, and it was, and it was kind of obvious. It, was, it felt to me that it would be obvious that you know she's probably going to be one of the only kind of um, black women that's kind of a big image uh, in this magazine. And, and as it turned out, she was. If you, I think there, there may be a tiny, tiny image of someone else, of another black person in this magazine, but it's very, very rare. And because I'd been through so many of the magazines, I, know I would just go through every issue and never see any of, of that. I mean, but, but now, I'm sure that would be totally changed in, in 2014, to a degree. <laughs> but, but, but at the time, it was very obvious to me. But, but it was very obvious to me, but maybe I, don't, I wasn't sure if it was obvious maybe to the audience. But a few people said they saw the advert and they, or the piece and they, they saw it, the message was obvious. But to me, yeah, that was, that was a, a, you know, but it was, it was very po-faced. It wasn't like a serious political point because it wasn't like my, I wasn't really trying to make some kind of big flag waving point, but it was just like the whole, the whole thing was a little bit of a slightly tongue in cheek. It was just all so ridiculous that I thought I'd, I'd do this slightly ridiculous, partly political statement. But even though it was slightly jokey, it wasn't, it, it I do, it, you know, it was, it was also, I do believe that, you know, I did believe the fact that there would be no, you know, I, I, and I was conscious of the underrepresentation as well. So it was half and half in a way. Okay, well, it was a long time ago, and I, and I suppose my work's developed a fair bit since then, but also not <laughs> in a weird way. Like, I did, do, I did used to do a lot of drawings at the time and make funny things, funny small things. You know, I'd studied sculpture, but it was, you know, I was certainly thinking about, um, uh, you know, conceptual approaches to work, as you, as you mentioned. Maybe not so much Dan Graham, maybe more people like Solar Witt or Donald Judd were my kind of slightly influences, but also, yeah, a little bit Jeff Koons. And, but also, you know, it was the, the late 90s, so there was also, you know, and I was in London, so there was all the stuff happening in London as well, the, the Brit young British artists or whatever, and, and um, uh, but also alternatives to that, people like Bank or, um, I can't remember who else was around, so, but, but you know, slightly more underground uh, artist-run spaces type things. Um, uh, so there was all, yeah, there was all, there was all that. It was definitely a very different kind of art scene. Um, than now, it but it was still a global art scene, like you mentioned. Um, and I think the thing about it was that it was and it was a pre-internet era as well. So that's I think that's probably quite important. Um, so yeah, so your so your sense of a global art world almost did come through looking at the magazines. You'd see an advert for shows in New York and uh, you know shows all, all around the world in Europe or um, you know occasionally in, in Africa maybe you know very rarely or somewhere like that. But so but so you did have the sense that the magazines at that time. Did almost represent the global art world, probably probably more than a, a lot of other things actually. But now that's totally changed with the internet and uh, well, probably mainly the internet. That that gives the sense of a global globalized um, you know world as and an art world fitting into that. So um, yeah, I think like I said, um, that was just that was just one way of tapping into that. But I did uh, you know, but I did like the fact that you were almost as you kind of hinted at, kind of creating a multiple. So the magazine was a multiple. It wasn't really clear. Where the objectness of the of the project li lies or lay or wherever whatever you know it, you know if I can always it doesn't really matter if it's this magazine that, that that I'm holding now or I can always go to a library and pick one up and so everyone can actually have access to that that artwork if they want um, so it's yeah it's it's it, there's definitely something about the uh, playing with the distribution of it which like you as you say um, I've I've always been I've always been interested in in my kind of curatorial work using different forms of um, uh, distribution methods and different ways and different locations to get artworks to different audiences and, and trying to put artworks in um, different situations than maybe they're, they're expected. But in a way, I, you always have to kind of think ahead of the game because you know suddenly everyone's doing that. Suddenly everyone's doing their art outside of the gallery or everyone's doing their art. In, so it's always like you know where 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 can it be unexpected but still have some um, you know maybe relevance or something like that. I think it was it was you know I, I think it was I think it was received fairly well I, you know I did I did quite well off of um, off of my degree I did a couple of shows fairly recently after doing my degree and you know I'm still in the art world somehow um, so um, so I guess it you know like it was it was a little bit of a manifesto it was a little bit of a kind of advert saying you know I'm here 
you know, watch out <laughs> or something. Uh, but I don't, know, I don't think it had an instant effect. There was no instant effect. But I think it, you know, I think people did see it. But, you know, but, but also it was also totally obscure because no one would have known what, who that person was, the majority of people that saw that advert. So, um, so I, I, you know, I, I imagine, I, you know, it was a bit like kind of maybe a bit of a ripple effect, but, I, you know, it's hard to quantify. But I think it did, it did um, give some element of some seriousness of intent, maybe. This is really a new um, set of drawings that I'm it's really fresh that I'm working on right now in my in my studio in, in Maastricht. Um, but I thought again it'd be quite relevant for this conversation. Um, basically, what I've been doing is I've been you know I've been I've, I get I'm lucky that I get to travel around a fair bit, and I've been to a few art fairs recently, um, and I've been looking at so I've been looking at basically what what's the work's come out of is I've been looking at artworks um, with uh, kind of modernist artworks from the kind of modernist tradition. Um, uh, which kind of have some relevance or reference to um, kind of African history somehow. So that's that's the main strand of it. So it's kind of modernist artworks uh, which 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 relate to um, African history. So they either they either or, or, or works which you might say come from African diaspora to kind of use one of your phrases. Um, so so it's yeah. So it's either the, the model. So it's you know it's usually so so it's, you know a typical example would be. Um, well, let's look at look at let's look at this Picabia example. But you know, you've got Picabia, a French artist, but he's 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 drawing African models, or a, you know. So it's basically it's looking at how um, African history or African aesthetics have influenced modernism, but maybe didn't always get the um, uh, the credit for that. Um, but that's 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 kind of where it leads to. But in but it, it very very practically, what I'm doing with these drawings is literally um, kind of remaking the drawings. Uh, or, or the images from of these modernist artists that I see when I travel around museums or art fairs, and I, I photograph them and I redraw details from them, but then I draw them virtually all in black with with quite heavy shading, so it's quite hard to make them out. So they almost look like negatives or, or wood prints. So it's quite hard to make them out, but it's it's very new, so I haven't really um, shown them to many people yet. So I don't know what the reaction is going to be to them yet. But I'm in my mind, I'm I'm you know I quite like the images because I, I quite like the the way they're almost quite hard to see, and I and I find these the subject matter quite interesting, you know. And it's and it, you know obviously it's a bit of a, a criticism in a way of, of that history, but but it's also you know there are actually artists that I admire. I'm, I'm a big fan of Picabia and I'm a big fan of Picasso, but I'm just but in a way I feel like I feel like a bit of a vampire, like going back through history and then re tracing these images and then somehow I feel like I'm reconnecting with the with the models and the subjects in in those artworks somehow so there's there's something slightly vampirish about it and some, somehow traveling through time and just yeah re reassessing those things but again I don't want to be uh, like didactic with the works I don't, they're not meant to be like they're not many really like telling anyone off or you know it's not like you know the bad boy Picabia you know you you racist you know it's not that's not the that's not the message it's it's more for my own you know it's more, it's just it's just a way of exploring what influences were there, and what, uh, and uh, yeah, what what were the influences, and what what were maybe some influences which haven't been fully acknowledged, but also yeah, just a, also just a new way of creating an image. My interest in modernism is actually probably a fairly new thing. I mean, I've always had a, a, a small interest, but I think just as I go on, I get more interested in, in art over the years and, and the history of art. And I, you know, you look at, you see more exhibitions, you go to more museums, you occasionally you work in museums and you see the works. And and um, I think my, my interest in modernism is, is is kind of growing. So it's not something I've always had. I've, I, I think initially I was I was all more interested in really contemporary work as younger but now I'm, I'm, I am getting more interested in, in modernism and actually but now being working in, in Holland right now I'm getting very interested in kind of you know early Flemish art and stuff like that and that's a totally different um, set of images again that I'm, I'm working with but it's, it's cool it's all it's all kind of uh, connected this kind of like traveling through history um, through artworks I suppose and I suppose there's something quite um, it almost feels quite digital to me in a way, even though it's a very analog thing. What it, it, it's, it's something. It's a bit like being on Google and you, you click on an image of Picabia and then and that takes you through to uh, the image of Picasso and then somehow you end up at a Bruegel and so you just go through this weird journey and every time it's different. It is actually, funny enough, very diff very similar to the conversations that we had when we were speaking to Nicholas Buriard and his all his ideas about alter modernism. It's, I've actually been thinking about that quite a lot and it's this idea of of, of using history as a um, well, I can't remember the phrase that he used, but just kind of time traveling through history, but always through different routes, and um, yeah, and then and then maybe, you know, just just um, 
cl kind of clicking on that on those moments of history and then maybe altering them slightly. So I've been thinking about that, and but I've but I have been thinking about what uh, Nicholas Burry I was talking about in that that whole ultra modern conversation because I'm interested in trying not to be purely postmodern in my action. I'm not trying to rewrite history's wrongs in a way that maybe some postmodernism does. I'm more interested in just travelling through different parts of of history and then just kind of clicking on it and then and then maybe going somewhere totally different to you know so one minute it's Bacabia, the next minute it's Goya, the next minute it's it's um, I, I don't know uh, Bruegel like I say or or it, or it could be a, an altarpiece in a, a, a chapel so I'm um, you know it's I, it's it's more about that traveling um, through history as opposed to trying to correct it I think Yeah, okay, that's an interesting question because I, you know, I come from more of a um, sculptural uh, background, and I, in a way, um, you know, we, well, we'll get to talk about a woodcut in a minute. And in a, in a way, and I always do a lot of drawing, so I guess I'm more interested in drawing than painting because when I do um, two-dimensional works, I'm always, in a way, trying to den deny a kind of um, kind of handmade or um, unique element to them. I, I always like something that. Um, isn't isn't you know you don't necessarily see the hand of the artist in you know the woodprints are a classic for that so I'm always interested in the idea that you can't quite grasp you know again where the object is like with a woodcut you know um, is the work in the in the plate that it comes from or is it in the, the print or is it unique but, but but more specifically with this drawing or this series of drawings they are more directly kind of painterly you could say or they're more they're more clear cut um, they're more clear cut um, two dimensional images as opposed to, you know, it's, they're, they're kind of, yeah, they're just one-off unique images in a way, but I am starting to do stuff with the, um, uh, the kind of ghost that they leave on the next page, but that's a different subject. So, so I, I don't know, my, my, I don't know what my history of painting is, I suppose, or my, what's the, the question was, what's my relationship with painting? I suppose my relationship with painting is I'm always trying, trying to deny it, trying to deny a painting, or I don't ever just want to do a regular painting, it's always somehow trying to, yeah, wriggle out of, of, of doing a straight cut painting on canvas or, you know, I mean the fact that these are on paper, I, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to avoid just doing a painting because I think I, yeah, I'm more interested in kind of objects. I mean, I, th I think the thing is, but maybe coming from a, um, a sculptural background, I do kind of believe in that, that Donald Judd quote of just objects, specific objects, you know, Donald Judd used to talk about specific objects. And I, yeah, I, I kind of think those separate, those, those, those. De I kind of agree with him on the on, on the idea of you don't really need to to have those those titles: uh, painting, sculpture. I I think it's a good question, and and I am certainly you know definitely through my through my curatorial or um, arts organising. Uh, works and writing research, like you say, I definitely am interested in popular culture, and not necessarily actually popular culture, but but more different different formats and different ways of of of, of um, distributing artworks, I suppose. Um, and sometimes that crosses over to popular culture. Oftentimes, probably more often than not, actually, it, it, it's actually incredibly obscure, <laughs> in, and and and, and incredibly, incredibly obscure and, and small scale projects that I do. I do much more pro many more projects that have very small audiences. Um, but occasionally I do, I do projects which have very big audiences, but the projects are usually the same, or the ideas are usually the same, but it's usually to do with, you know, various, you know, you know bureaucratic issues as to the, uh, how, those, how those audiences come about. So, um, but I, I guess there is, a, I think what I'm trying to think about a lot these days, and with, with this year I'm doing in the Anne Van Eyck, is how my curatorial uh, work and how my, my studio practice, how they cross over. Um, so I'm, I'm really trying to spend a lot of time doing that and, and through that I'm, I'm, I'm making a lot of my own work. But I am interested in organising projects, I am interested in, in um, you know, different distribution methods of artworks and projects and I am interested in different audiences. But, um, but I, always, I, you know, I always think about it in, in lots of different ways and I don't necessarily believe in just forcing lots of art on, on, on the public who don't necessarily want it. Um, but, I, I, but, I do, but I do believe that um, you know, art can be amazing you know, if, if, if if um, you know when presented in the right way, but I think for these drawings, actually, you know, I haven't really thought have, they're not—they're just sketches right now in a book, and and quite possibly where they where where they will end up will be in some kind of publication that present, potentially will be distributed, um, you know, on mass uh, through some kind of publication or magazine or something like that. Um, so that so that the, so the presentation of the, these drawings um, will be an element that will 
hopefully come into the work when I'm when I've finished making the drawings. So so it, it kind of it's it's quite linked in a way to the to the magazine advert. It's still a similar idea of how to distribute works to to different people and and then again you'll, you'll have that same question if you, if you turn those drawings into a, a magazine which is given away for free you're kind of me messing around with the economy of everything and stuff like that. Yes, uh, I think it's something I'm certainly conscious of, and um, and yeah, and when I go through looking at lots of these works that are in this kind of modernist canon, you, you become more conscious of it. So when I'm trying to select works to draw, um, you know, you, def you definitely notice that there are lots of female models. And so what I have to do is, w with that series of drawings, is is restrict. Um, you know, I don't only want to draw that. So it's it, you know, so I have to find other subjects as well. Um, so I'm definitely very conscious of it. Um, and um, I, I'm not sure actually. The, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's it's probably more obvious uh, uh, within the wind, within the within the within the woodcuts, which we'll talk about. Um, but no, I'm certainly very conscious of, of gender in various different um, you know projects I do. I think yeah, I, I think that's probably what I would say. This uh, woodcut is. Um, Part of an ongoing series I was doing around about last year, um, where it, it's taking different elements and different uh, visual styles, uh, different languages, and trying to place them down. I mean, place them on one um, picture flame, picture picture plane, I suppose you could say. Um, yeah, there's various elements to it. There's the kind of there's the figurative wood carving element, which are the kind of the blue figures and the yellow elements are, are wood carving, and the background is painted red. So, um, so you've got this kind of um, pictogram style uh, or logoistic almost style uh, imagery, um, which are kind of aiming to, yeah, almost like almost almost suggest the narrative, but not necessarily give the narrative away. So the idea is just to, yeah, suggest the story, but not like have a have a uh, completed story um, be be told, and then. Um, what else can you add to that? So, so yeah, so you've got that. that that's the, the 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 visual. Let's say the figurative side of it is is this kind of narrative. But also to me, oh, that's always been very important. It's quite um, uh, it's quite strong in this work actually. Is is also the colours as well. You know, the the fact it's you know yellow and and red and blue. It's kind of like they're quite kind of. Very, again, very modernist, traditional kind of modernist, um, almost distill or something like that style colours. And so again, it almost it does hark back a little bit to um, some ideas of Donald Judd and this kind of colour theories and how how different colours, when placed together, kind of create a meaning. And I mean, I've always been interested in the idea of colours kind of creating meaning. So, so to me, at least, uh, the colours kind of should suggest as much of the narrative. As the uh, as the as the figurative elements, so yeah, so that you've got the red and the yellow, which is kind of quite a jarring uh, color combination, and the blue, and then you've got these kind of um, there's a kind of silver backing uh, with this kind of kind of voodoo voodoo graffiti kind of drips, kind of my own um, kind of experimental language, which I was I was kind of playing around with at the side. So again, at the time, rather, and and so again, there's a kind of contrast between. This super graphic hands off hands hands off uh, language of the figures, and then these these kind of drawn drippy elements, which are very and then the background red as well, which is obviously very handmade. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it, I think that that's already quite a lot to go be going on. I think in the image, and then also I think the scale of it as well is quite a unique thing because they're they're quite big uh, wood carvings as far as wood carvings go. So I think for me the personal challenge of making these quite. Um, Quite large-scale wood carvings was was um, yeah, the, the challenge of that is is kind of part of the part of the process, part of the work really, and it's something I'm still uh, experimenting with. Okay, so I guess that for me the the woodcuts again always very much relate to the drawing. So it starts off with the drawing and the images, and the, and the drawings kind of have these different strands, whether they're drawn from reality or life, or uh, drawn from art history sometimes, or just drawn from images I'm interested in that I just look up on the computer and, and do this time traveling thing or whatever. So they, they start off with these drawings and they get transformed very simply into uh, wood, wood prints that get carved out and then they get kind of hand printed um, usually with the help of, of someone else because they're quite large and they get hand printed, hand pressed um, on paper usually. 
Um, so it's quite a kind of, you know, it's quite a, there's quite a few uh, sequences in the process. It's quite a process-based um, thing to do. The, the drawings are very quick. It's something I often talk about. The drawings are very quick. Often everything I do is quite quick, all the different processes. But, but in a, so in a way, what the, the woodcuts kind of came about through doing lino cuts, which turned into woodcuts. And it was always a way of trying to somehow slow down this process. And I think there is an element of slowness that, you, that maybe comes through in the woodcuts, which doesn't necessarily come through in the, in the drawings, because the drawings are actually much, usually much quicker. Um, so there's that element of trying to slow the drawings down. And um, actually what I should say as well, which I think is probably quite an important thing, is that they are very deliberately kind of analog. Like they're really antiquated. It's kind of like just something that just, it's like vinyl records, you know, it's just like there's no need for this. But it's, there's something just actually quite pleasurable in, in maybe doing it. And I think people do, um, uh, do appreciate that when they see it. That somehow people do connect the fact that this, this is a very old process, a very almost a slightly pointless process. Uh, in terms of the making, uh, the way it's made, but just there is just something about the handmade, you know, almost the surface of the of the of the of the print of the wood and the and the and the image. It's almost you know, it's probably something that I don't know Greenberg might have talked about or something like that. Just this thing of the surface of the image that's so different to um, you know something that's digital um, that I that I think is worthwhile pursuing, particularly now actually. So it's it's something I'm, it's kind of like a gamble. I'm, it's like I'm doing this gamble with myself, and I'm I'm, I'm you know I, I'm, I'm I've got nothing against digital uh, processes, and I could easily be doing those projects because uh, I have interest in there as well. But I've decided to focus on this stuff, which seems to be a kind of dying um, um, process or medium or whatever, uh, because I think maybe in 20, 30 years time, they're somehow still going to look like they were made in 2014, but but you know that, but somehow, strangely, ha that hopefully still have some um, kind of aura around them. Um, it kind of, it, I'm, fa you know, I get, in, you get the interest comes through the necessity of doing it. You could say, you know, if that doesn't sound, you know, it's like so I, I was never particularly interested in in wood carving tools. But when I started doing wood carving, actually, the, those wood carving tools are, are actually quite interesting and the process is, is interesting so it's you know the interest comes through learning like I'm no by no means a uh, trained printmaker and not really that interested in, in being a printmaker but when I'm doing it I, I get interested in the various different processes um, and it's, it's kind of a, a kind of need it's kind of like a need for efficiency so you want to be efficient with the process and then having a really good wood carving tool is more efficient than having a really bad one <laughs> you know so that so that the, the, the interest in craft comes through wanting to be efficient That's a tricky one, you know. I, I, you know, I think, I think um, it's just really difficult these days. I mean, um, you know, the, I think I probably was interested in subversion, and I, I am vaguely interested in subversion. But it's, it just get, it's just, you know, cult, you know, it's. I'm not sure even how you can be subversive anymore. Maybe I've just, maybe just been battered down. But it just, it just seems every element of of society and culture is accessible. There's, you know, and probably the most subversive person is the person that, you know works works as, as a post office clerk you know by day and then and then has some insane um, hobby or pastime in the evenings and and and, and never reveals that um, I, if that's you know maybe I don't know I don't know I don't know where subversion lies anymore I think I was interested in subversion I, but but it just seems like I'm just not sure where it exists uh, anymore but I, it seem <coughs> it's just maybe it's this, it's this idea of, of subcultures you know it's very it's hard to think of subcultures anymore because everything the ma everything just gets consumed and becomes repackaged so i suppose my interest in subversion if i am still thinking about it is how 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 can i fit into that world and and, and um you know what do you, what do you want to do uh in that in that situation if that makes sense so i am you know i am interested in in these things but in terms of the um <coughs> the images and the artwork. I, funny, the funny thing I would say about the there are a couple of kind of fetish uh, style figures in there, or gimp, gimp style figures. Um, and in a way, I think what's interesting about that is um, I think there's something very creative about um, that, that kind of kind of like uh, yeah, that, I guess that kind of fetish scene. It's like for normal people who don't necessarily do art, there's something very creative in getting dressed up and and taking photographs of themselves or making videos. It's a kind of 
quite a big creative outlet for a lot of people who probably wouldn't, you know, maybe they see it as creative, maybe they don't, but it's, there is something quite creative about that. Also, I just like the kind of ambiguity of those images. They kind of look quite friendly. And everything I draw tends to, see, tends to have a bit of a childlike, uh, slight, you know, slightly naive element to it. I remember once I, I did a show which had the same figures in it and there was a kind of kid that came along to the opening and he, I think he or she, I can't remember, was kind of pointing at the images and I think the, my friend's parent was saying, oh look, it's a rabbit man. And you know, it's kind of quite sweet. And a lot, I, I'm very conscious of, of that stuff. Um, you know, I kind of want kids to be able to, to like my work actually. I think I am certainly interested in artists like Basquiat and um, um, uh, Keith Haring, and well, all, all, obviously, I've got a, I've got a big interest in um, the history of graffiti writing and um, of street art, and um, and that certainly comes through in um, a lot of the works that I do. More, more so, perhaps, in the use of materials. You know, I use spray paint, I use dripping pens, I use a lot of the materials um, sometimes, and and people often look at my work and and compare it to Basquiat. But I'm also as interested in. Um, uh, you know Ger German expressionism and 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 uh, that you know th th those artists from there. I mean, I'm, I'm as interested in George Gross as I am in Basquiat. You know, so I think that and I think the the influence is equal. And I suppose there is so so you know I, w I would I would I would I would kind of argue that there's as much influence or interest in in, in that in the, all, all those different histories. Um, maybe it doesn't come through, but I, I but also I think there's the difference between what I'm doing. And, and artists like uh, Keith Haring and Basket, who I massively admire, is there's a certain element of um, kind of a fake expressionism. Whereas I think Basquiat, and not so much Haring, but Basquiat certainly was, was uh, kind of, you know, I think at the end of the day it was, it was kind of authentic. It, potentially, I think it was kind of authentic. But you could probably say, I mean, I mean he, was, he was kind of a star, you know, he was this kind of rock star artist. But his work, when you look at it, it's, it, I don't know. Maybe maybe he's questioning the idea of maybe you know maybe he's questioning the idea of authenticity. But um, I think I'm questioning it at another level. I mean, at least with a Basquiat, you kind of see his hand gesture. With mine, you see sometimes my hand gesture, but also you see it's a print and the, and the the woodcut print, the way that it's done by hand, it gives an element of expressionism and it seems expressionistic and it seems emotional but actually there's no emotion there and I don't, I don't actually even have to make it myself you know I don't actually have to do that printing bit but whoever does it, it it gives this sense of emotion and expression so there's just that further layer of remove with some of those prints I think uh, which I would say was maybe the big difference between me and those modern and those postmoderns. I think, okay, the term post-black art, probably for you, I mean, uh, you, for you, Paul. I, I certainly knew, I, and I'm, I'm familiar with a, the kind of black art movement um, in the UK from the 80s, and, and, and I, you know, I could, I could say a few names of artists uh, who I associate with that movement, and I know that, you know, it's a slightly contested term and, and this kind of thing. Um, in terms of the term post-black art, it's not really a term that's in co re big um, common usage in, uh, for me, and I had to kind of look it up, um, knowing that we were going to have this conversation. So, and then, I, and then, and, and now I, I know that it's a term related to Falma Golden and the exhibition she did. And I had actually heard of that show, but it just wasn't, you know, fresh in my memory. It, my, my understanding, and maybe maybe what I think of it or how I relate to it, is perhaps um, artists that come from maybe an African diaspora, like you would say. Um, but who don't necessarily focus on that in their work. So the, the fact that you um, are, are a black artist doesn't necessarily uh, govern your work. And I can, I can actually 100% relate to that. So just because you're a black artist doesn't mean you only make work about being a black artist. Um, that would be my understanding of it. I think it's certainly a very different history in Europe and in the UK than it is in, in America. There's, I mean, it's, it's such a different structure. Even though we do live in this, obviously, this global community and global world and global art world, um, I, do, I, do, I do think there's a, there's a really different uh, context uh, for artists working in Europe and in the UK, particularly, um, you know, just in terms of, uh, well, in, ter in terms of all levels, actually. I mean, e even in terms of art school. I mean, the people that you've, you know, I never had one black tutor uh, uh, well, well, through my entire degree or um, uh, foundation. 
So, um, you know, I don't, and, 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 and I'm not sure how much, I think that's, that, that's probably changed a bit now, but, I th but if I was doing a, 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 a BA or an MA in America, I, I imagine that might, that, you know, especially if it's somewhere like New York, you know, you would have hoped that that might not have been the same case. So, so from, from, your, from your, um, your reference points, as soon as you're at, uh, into art school, you know, I think your reference points are different. So, and then, and then, and then now, you know, in the UK, you know, you can you can maybe think of a couple of of of, of galleries that maybe have black directors or are started by uh, commercial galleries. That is, uh, and then and even curators or museum directors or or art critics or art critics that write for um, national newspapers. You know, it's 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 still very hard to think of these people, um, you know, who 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 are black or Asian or come from those different backgrounds. Um, and I think, I, but, it, but it's easier for me to think of those people in similar positions for in an American context, actually. So, so I just think the whole point of, of reference is quite different. Um, you know, what, basically what I'm maybe saying is there's, it maybe feels like if you're an American artist, there's a, there's, there, it, there is potentially an audience out there. Whereas if in the UK, it feels like it's, you're not necessarily, you know, you, there, there is maybe an audience, but it's maybe harder to, to reach that audience because let's say the, uh, the guard dogs of the, of the culture are, are, are not the same. I don't know if that makes f full sense, but um, so yeah. So I just I think it's 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 a very different context, but that doesn't mean it's not worthwhile doing. And I think in my work, it's uh, maybe it's you know I am obviously thinking about a lot of these issues, but not but but not only I'm not only thinking about those issues. I'm also thinking about you know homeless homeless people in Bruegel, you know. Um, yeah, I read this question, and it's you know it's a it's a tricky question, and it's a good question. Uh, you know, that it, it sh should we define art by race or uh, gender or stuff like that? And I don't think you know I I, I it would be terrible to, to have a wing at uh, uh, you know the National Portrait Gallery that was the the black art wing or the the, the woman's art wing. No, nobody wants that. But um, but nobody also wants no artists. Uh, from, from that are black or that are female in the National Gallery as well. So I think you need to be aware of it and you, you, know, you need to encourage it. I, I'm, you know, a bit of positive discrimination, I'm, I'm not opposed to it actually, if, if there is under-representation. Under um, but I think you don't want to over, it doesn't, you know, you, I, I think you, you know, I don't think you need to kind of segregate it out as well. Uh, so I think that's probably answered that question. Certainly, um, it's a different. You know, I think you know. I think there is some kind of sense of the global art world. There, are, and as we were talking about before, you know, there are clearly there are events that happen around the world, um, which oftentimes you see the same people at if you can afford to to fly to those those different events. So there is clearly some kind of global art world um, happening. Even, but even the term art world is a is a slightly term I could I could probably maybe have some kind of contentions with, but for the time being, I won't bother. But, um, but yeah, there is some kind of, you know, there is a global art world and there are these big events, these mega events and art fairs and biennales and big exhibitions that happen and publications. And, and then also the internet now as well, like I said before, all adds to this sense of a, a kind of global, you know, community and maybe the loosest sense. Um, but then the, I think what's more interesting is actually that there are different kind of layers to that. You know, you don't necessarily have to actually be flying around to all these glamorous things, or you know, be super rich um, to partake in that, because you can actually just communicate with people online, and 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 it can also it can also function at a much lower level and post people things. And I think it's and and actually maybe it's it's as interesting or equally as interesting to to be able to function at a real low level and not have to be able to afford those flights all over the place and still feel like you're in 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 um, in some kind of communication that's taking place, uh, you know, outside of your village, let's say. And I, but I think that's always happened as well. There's always I think that you know I feel like I've always kind of had pen friends or been in touch with people around the world, and I've always had that curiosity to travel. And I think a lot of people have. That's a tricky question, I don't know how, especially in relation to alt modern. You know, I suppose I'm just trying to make my work. In the end of the day, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to make my work and make it the best I can, and and maybe make it a little bit for the future. But in terms of a kind of global conversation, um, I know I think it's interesting. I mean, 
it's interesting now because I'm, obviously we're in London at the minute, but I'm working in in Maastricht uh, for for a year, and in Maastricht I'm you know I'm really in touch with a lot of artists who have all, who have come from all corners of the world, and we're all having various conversations, um, uh, which is really great. Um, but a funny thing, a friend of mine said the other day, you know, you travel halfway around the world um, to go on these kind of residency programs, and you end up meeting people that are exactly like you. So there, I think there is an element of who you have these conversations with. You know, it's not as if I'm really going into the favelas and, and, and meeting the, those kids from the favelas and going out and doing some, some pishador or something. Um, I'm kind of, you know, when I go to Sao Paulo, I end up, you know, speaking to people in galleries that are probably a bit like me. So, you know, there are global, co there are global co uh, conversations, but um, it maybe depends on who you have them with. But overall, what I would say is, you know, I think travel is generally is great, and I, I, I really learn a lot through traveling. Um, and speaking to people and having, so you know, even though if they are similar to you, you still can learn something. Um, yes, I ha I, I've been involved in, um, uh, I've been involved in um, a, a, a couple of biennales and art fairs. Actually, um, yeah, I've got a lot to say about that, I suppose. I mean, I've been involved in both, in, in, in a lot of different sides, actually. I've, I've been involved as an organizer of a, uh, uh, Biennale in uh, uh, as a kind of uh, kind of some some kind of curator, and I've probably participated in a couple as well as an artist, um, and also I have been involved in um, some art fairs, uh, at participating in panel discussions and, and so forth. Um, maybe a little bit selling work, but not so much, or, or at least at least having work on the stands. And then, but more recently, actually, in the last couple of weeks, I've been going to quite a lot of art fairs just as a viewer, which I often do as well. But then also it's been feeding back into my work because I've been looking at, like I say, these modernist artworks and kind of taking photographs. So I'm starting to use the art fair um, almost as, a, as a, a kind of a material to draw from, actually. And that's, that's kind of proving quite interesting. Um, so, you know, they, all of these things are, have, the, have their positives and negatives. Uh, I think the f I've, I, was, I was in a Biennale a long time ago in, in Tirana. Um, and then I was in a, uh, I was worked on organising a, a biennale in uh, Busan, sculpt biennale. Um, I'm not sure if there have been any others, but uh, you know, overall, you know, they're they're, they're kind of um, so so. It's not like I've got massive experience. Uh, I, oh, actually, well, I worked on the the, the Tate Triennial as well uh, with with Nicholas Buriard, which we were we were talking about. I just worked on that a, a little bit. Um, so. You know, I, so I've, I wouldn't say that I have massive experience in that in that world. And it's funny when you meet artists that do have massive experience because there is some, you know, there. I think it was. Um, I don't know Eric von Liescholt very well, the Dutch artist, but I remember bumping into him. I think it was. <laughs> if you ever know him, he's he's kind of a funny guy. And he, I think it was in Busan actually that I bumped into Eric, and he, you know, he'd lost his wallet and he'd lost his passport, and he was like, "You have to lose your wallet and your passport the first thing you do <laughs> when you get to a Biennale, and, and just be totally lost and confused for the first two days." But that's maybe. Maybe Eric, but I think there are some artists that are professional kind of Biennale artists and that's all they do and they've probably done 50 or 60, uh, 60 Biennales and triannuals and all that kind of stuff and that, that's a whole, and that's great for them and, and that they're, they're on a kind of constant junket, but I'm not, I'm not um, like that at the minute, I suppose. Though I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, you know, I, I, just, I just want to make every project as good as possible, but that's in terms of the, uh, being an artist in those, in those types of shows. Um, and then in terms of organising them, yeah, again, it's quite limited experience, but I've done a bit of it. Well, I, I, I often use the word organiser uh, as opposed to curator because I think, the, you know, I'm not opposed in theory to the word curator and I think it's great, but it's, I think it has become so popular, the term curator, you know. Uh, I think Sainsbury's have got a curator for the cheese section, you know. <laughs> um, so, I, 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 you know, so I, 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 it's become such a trendy, zeitgeisty word. Um, and I'm actually very interested in the kind of history of curating and I love those books that Hans Ulrich's done, you know. So I'm, I'm actually very interested in it. Um, but still, I, you know, in, I think in Europe they much more use the term exhibition maker. Um, and if you say secretary, for example, it just doesn't seem as glamorous as curator. So, you know, if you, basically, you know, when you're, if, you're, if you're a curator, 
it, it's it's kind of secretarial work, really. You're making phone calls and trying to borrow artworks and book book people's uh, flights and stuff. So there's all different. Uh, I, but I think the interesting thing about curating and the term curating is is the meaning has kind of changed from being a kind of curate or someone who looks after a collection, essentially. I think to now kind of anybody who organises any set of things from a Flickr account or cheese or whatever. So, um, and that's probably a good thing. It's probably good to embrace that. And I know, I think, for example, Hans Ulrich Obrist, who's probably the fountain of knowledge, as far as I'm concerned, in, you know, in terms of the history of curating. Um, and I think he very much embraces the, uh, the, the, the constant shifting of the meaning of the word curating. So probably best to follow him on that one. But personally, you know, I, I often just say organiser because it just seems a bit more humble. Um, but no, I, you know, I think o o as well as having this kind of new media glamour uh, associated to the term curator uh, and the practice of it, um, there's also a bit of a kind of um, suspicion and uh, begrudgement amongst artists and various people to create it. They think, they're, they think these, that, they're, that, that somehow taste or, or, or whatever is being imposed on them like by these curators. And, there may be an element of that, but I, I, I often, I'll, I'll often argue the case for the curator, um, even you know, in tr trying to be fairly neutral about it. Just that you know, they do. They, you know, it's it's important often. If an artist is working with an institution, um, it's actually quite good to have a bit of a barrier between the the institution and the artist, and and someone can be in the middle to kind of negotiate on both parts. Often, and often. Um, certainly, my experience, I've found myself doing that. You know, you're trying to do the best for the artist, and you're trying to do the best for the institution. You've got everyone's interests um, kind of at hand, and you can somehow be a mediator that um, might not be able to happen otherwise. That's one, just just one example. There's all sorts of there's all sorts of positive, very positive things that curators can do. I think. Um, and, it, and, it, and, and and there's all sorts of different institutions that exist in, and so being a curator in a mega uh, or a mega museum is very different to being a, a curator in a, in a in a small, uh, you know, a, a very small institution. But they're both doing a similar job, and it's probably inter interchangeable. So I, you know, I, I you know, here, here's to the curators, <laughs> like yourself. What, yeah, one of the things I'm thinking about and uh, I've been thinking about is, is yeah, how does my artwork, uh, studio work, and my and my curatorial um, work, how do they how do they match together? And I and I think the thing I have been thinking more recently and that I didn't maybe really acknowledge um, when I've been working in institutions and stuff is that, or, or I didn't acknowledge it, but uh, maybe maybe externally people did. But I've I am actually really like an artist curator, and I'm very interested actually. In the history of artists as curator, or artists as organizer, or artists as, as exhibition maker, um, and in a way, that's always what I've been doing. And I've always actually approached the, the, the organizing projects I've done very much as an artist. And that's somehow why maybe that's maybe why my projects have always had a bit of a different bent to just strictly institutional um, curators. But maybe, and, but, yeah, but sometimes I've actually been in an institution, so I've been in a, a unique position to be a kind of artist curator, but with an institutional position. And I guess I still manage, and now I've done, now I've done that a few times. I, I can, I still manage to do it. But I still think I am. I've always, I'm always been an artist first. Um, you know, and I studied fine art, and I, you know, so I've always been an artist first, and I always approach projects as an artist. I think, and that's maybe the unique thing. But now, m now the the question for me is how to, yeah, how to pull it back and actually l allow my own work to exist within the projects I've been doing. So um, that's what I'm, 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 I'm spending time thinking about. But um, because I, I, I would never, for example, claim my curatorial projects as artworks, I, and, I, and I think that was, that would be terrible to do that. Because I think a good organizer, curator, exhibition maker, your job is almost to be invisible and allow the artworks to to talk and and do and, and really do the best thing for those artists and really help those artists achieve maybe a project that they couldn't do otherwise. So um, and that's never going to happen if you're trying to be an artist as well as that. So you kind of have to remove yourself from the process. So yeah, I guess I'm trying to bring it back round a little bit, and I think maybe I need a creator to help me with that, you know. <laughs> yeah, but that's maybe that's but actually Jan van Eyck is being very good at uh, helping me think about those ideas. <laughs>